Uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm going to speak broadly today. I'm going to talk about the exposome and children's health. Um, but before that, I want to talk, tell everyone about our program at UCSF. Um, as Cindy mentioned, I am the director of the program on reproductive health and the environment at UCSF. And the mission of our program is to create a healthier environment for human reproduction and development. And we focus on advancing scientific inquiry, but we also look at how to link uh, the sciences to improve clinical care and health policies. And our goal is to prevent harmful exposures and to improve health. And the theme of my talk today is going to be talking about how do we take the science that we have, particularly as it relates to understanding exposures to environmental chemicals, and link that to various actions in order to advance our not only our understanding about the extent of exposures to environmental chemicals, but also how do we take that information and improve the health of either our patients or the public. So this is the model that we use um, at our UCSF Children's Center. We have an NIHS EPA funded Children's Environmental Health Center, and we knit together uh, work with the laboratory scientists in basic developmental sciences, as well as population epidemiology sciences recruiting pregnant patients at hospitals at UCSF. But a key linkage in all this is understanding exposures to our patients and to their um, children, and how do we look at that and understand how that may be adversely impacting development, and then how do we translate that science to improve clinical care and public policy. So before I get to the work that we're doing, we're going to go back a little bit in time, because I think the history of biomonitoring is both fascinating and insightful into the work that we're doing today. So for people, um, uh, recall, maybe you do or maybe you don't, that there was a very transformative report that came out from the National Center for Environmental Health um, in, in CDC that was around 2001. And it was very important because this was the first time that the N NHANES, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a survey, it's a representative survey of the U.S. population um, it's used to understand health effects and certain types of risk factors, but it's also used to collect biological samples from which chemicals can be measured. And in 2001, this was the first time that the NHANES data, which we all are very familiar with because we use it a lot to understand many exposures in the, human, in the U.S. population, this is the first time that they went from mo monitoring just three chemicals, lead, cadmium, and copamine, to expanding it. And it was a pretty modest expansion. It, tw it was 27 chemicals in the U.S. population. But what was remarkable was that well, they added metals, which is understandable, and organic organophosphate pesticides, which was something that EPA um, does a lot of work in. But they added this chemical, which were phthalates. And up until this report, we didn't really, we basically, there was no information about phthalate exposures in the population. People didn't even think people were exposed to these common contaminants that we find in our everyday products like phthalates. And the way that it was actually discovered, if you talk to people who were there at the time, was it was an, uh, somewhat of an accidental discovery because they were looking at some type of contamination that was happening and they were trying to measure PCBs. But they ended up being very smart about this and looking at the samples and measuring them um, in the samples that they had from NHANES. And what they found was that multiple phthalates were found in virtually all of the U.S. population. This was really quite a stunning finding at the time, and people were really surprised. And what was even more interesting about it was that um, there was a paper that was published off of this by Ben Blount in EHP in 2000. And what he found was that, yes, people were, pretty much everyone had some measurable levels of phthalates in their bodies, but there were some phthalates that were measured at higher levels in women. So the metabolites of dibutyl phthalate was found at significantly higher levels in women of reproductive age, 50% higher. And again, this was the first time that people actually had, could, were able to look using exposure data, exposure biomonitoring data, and to understand, well, that is really unusual. What is it about this group 
of people, these women, that they're doing that's different than other people that makes them have higher exposures to this chemical. So uh, the government actually didn't sort of go down this path, but a group that did was um, the Environmental Working Group Coming Clean and Healthcare Without Harm, which published this quite seminal report measuring these, what they hypothesized was that, well, women are more likely to be using different types of uh, beauty products or personal care products than other people in the population. So things like uh, perfume, hair conditioner, shampoo, underarm deodorant, lotions, nail polish. So they actually bought all these different products and then they measured them and what they found was that they were full of these different types of phthalates, the same ones that were being measured and found higher in women of reproductive age. This is a really quite seminal report because people for the first time, people didn't realize that the products that you're buying, that the chemicals in them could come out and migrate and that, that you could be exposed to them and that, that we could then measure them. So the other uh, line of evidence that was happening around the same time was that there were a number of studies that were being conducted, uh, some of them out of a lab at EPA, on what were the reproductive health effects of phthalates. There were a lot, number of animal studies that showed that phthalates could interfere with uh, testosterone levels, that they thus could become a male reproductive toxicant, um, and that they were a hormone disruptor, and that these animal studies showed that with uh, higher levels of phthalates, that the uh, male infant phthalates, when they were exposed, the exposures occurred prenatally, that the infants had increased levels of deformities of the male reproductive tract and lower testosterone levels. And there was also at the time some human epidemiological evidence that was also reflective of this animal evidence. But the animal evidence was very compelling because you had exposures that you were measuring higher in women of reproductive age, and then you had a link to these animal studies that showed that if you were pregnant or more exposed to this chemical, that there could be an adverse effect on their babies. So the other thing about phthalates that we've learned more and more about is that they aren't just used in cosmetics and personal care products. There was also an important study similar around that time looking at because people started to wonder, well, what are how are phthalates used? Phthalates, one of the main uses of phthalates is a plasticizer. One of its main uses is to make hard plastic soft and flexible. So that means what are there's so many uses of soft, flexible um, materials in everyday products, so things like flexible toys. Um, things like medical equipment and tubing. There was a number of studies showing that small infants who were in the NICU could get higher exposure to certain phthalates because of the metal, uh, the tubing and equipment. Um, there was, I've gone on to building material. There was also phthalates are used to convey scent, so things was later measured in different types of products that convey scents, art supplies, uh, coatings and pharmaceuticals and a cars or just some of the other applications where people can be exposed to phthalates. So what happened after this, this data came, became available? Well, first of all, the environmental um, and the health community had a campaign to talk to the, um, primarily the personal care product industry, but the public saying that um, it was very focused on getting the industry to remove phthalates from cosmetics. And here's two of the ads that they ran um, in various newspapers. And interestingly, this one right here for baby, it could really be poison. This perfume, which is they was one of the um, this that they measured, they measured phthalates in this particular perfume. This perfume's name was Poison, and it had the highest levels of phthalates. And it's actually one of the most expensive products that they purchased and measured. They had this campaign around nail polish and uh, mistreatment USA. And this, essentially the goal was to highlight that the, these cosmetic companies who wasn't really their intention to sell toxic products but were basically marketing products that could be toxic to women. Um, so what we saw also from this was because of the exposures and the length of the health effects, and that there was a, a particular importance about being exposed during vulnerable periods of development, but that we saw a lot of movement on the 
policy front as well. So Europe banned the use of phthalates in toys uh, very early on. Um, this was followed by a ban actually in the state of California, it was signed by Governor Schwarzenegger, who banned phthalates in certain uh, in certain phthalates and toys. And then we also saw a national ban on phthalates and toys. You can see here the little rubber ducky that some of the groups used to talk about uh, the importance of this ban bill. And this was actually signed by President Bush. So actually we had a law that was based on this finding and both the exposure and then the health effects leading to bans on this uh, toxic chemical. And then what happened was, this is from a study that I did with the Ami Zoda, who's at GW, showing that after the levels in phthalates were measured in 2001 and 2, that those phthalates that were banned, the levels of those phthalates, as you measured them in the population subsequently over later years, went down. You can see from 2001 to 2, 2009 and 10, there was a marked decrease in the phthalates that were banned. So those were DBP, BEHP, and butobenzyl phthalate. But interestingly, the, smart, the phthalates that weren't banned, the vessel phthalate, but was the focus of the market-based campaigns because they were found um, very, they were also found highly in these personal care products. Also, we saw a decrease in people over across the United States over time, indicating that the industries and the products are both responding to policy incentives as well as the pressure by outside groups to detoxify their products. But what was interesting was that the phthalates, it wasn't that they decided not to use phthalates at all. They essentially were seeing as a substitution of certain phthalates um, after the ban. So we're seeing the phthalates that hadn't been as prominently used were being were increasing in the population and being used as a replacement. So the line is that one of the conclusions about the science here is that policy interventions are very successful in lowering exposures to uh, different types of industrial contaminants. And though NHANES has gone on to greatly expand the number of chemicals that they're monitoring, so one of their original successes from using biomonitoring in NHANES was measuring the phase out, the result of the phase out of lead from gasoline, which started in the 1970s. And um, again, it was very interesting when you talk to people at the time, a lot of people weren't really sure that they were seeing blood lead levels drop during the 70s to the 80s. They thought there might be some type of analytic chemistry challenge that was happening, but it turned out that once you put the, um, graph of the blood lead levels next to what was going on with lead and gasoline, which was being phased out in the 70s, that you could indeed see that the drop was in large part. There were other areas that lead was phased out, but in large part was driven by the drop in lead and gasoline to the benefit of the public because there was a lead is a neurodevelopmental toxicant. Lowering lead levels can increase uh, uh, IQ points, which EPA has monetized um, to billions of dollars. But the, one of the challenges of looking at the science is that the, inter, the actions taken to reduce the harmful chemical exposures are often too slow. So, so it was great that we that lead was phased out in the 1970s. The reality was that lead has been known to be a neurotoxicant for many decades, even centuries, and that it was being actively added and promoted um, in various products from the 1920s to the 1970s. So this is an ad uh, from the, about ethyl lead and using ethyl gasoline, uh, from ethyl gasoline, it's about using uh, leaded gasoline. Um, lead was added to paint, and highly advertised, uh, and also advertising was used to promote, to engage with children or even children's products that promoted the idea of using this white lead paint. So what we're trying to do is change this narrative so that we are not closing the door after it's too late in terms of looking, finding these exposures, not understanding their harm, and then addressing them. So today we have a lot of challenges related to our newer understanding about exposures to chemicals in the population. So one is that since the 
biomonitoring program really, the National Biomonitoring Program has expanded and we've had more of a focus on uh, environmental health. We've also seen a concurrent change in the health of children over the last couple of decades where we're seeing a much, uh, we're seeing increases in children who have different types of chronic health conditions. This is from a report that NIEHS and EPA put together uh, uh, talking about the progress of the Children's Environmental Health Centers. And in it, they note that there's still uh, lots, many children who have different types of chronic health conditions, whether it's asthma, autism, neurodevelopmental disorders, or increases in those diseases and others, such as um, different types of childhood cancers, like childhood leukemia, which has increased by 35% over the past 40 years. So today we have a large number of chemicals that are produced in the United States. Chemical production has increased greatly since the 1950s. We have chemicals in not just phthalates and different types of plastic products, but many different types of chemicals used in different products, whether it's flame retardants, um, PFAS chemicals, which are used in nonstick applications, EPA and other types of plasticizers, um, or things that are used in food and food packaging. And I just wanted to show this other uh, data on chemical production growth because this just came out, um, I think, last week, which is the second edition of the Global Chemical Outlook. And it shows global chemical production, which is in orange, in projections for increases. As you can see, it's gone up since 1990, 2010, projected to increase to 2020 and beyond, and that the pace of chemical production is greater than the growth in the pop global population. And their estimate is, is that the per capita consumption of chemicals is increasing steadily. So it's a big challenge that we have in the United States because this is data from the uh, US EPA. This is from 2014, but the data is pretty similar to 2016 from their uh, chemical data release uh, inventory, there's 9.5 trillion pounds of chemicals produced in the United States. That's about 30,000 pounds of chemicals per person. So it's inevitable that we'll be exposed to many of these different types of industrial chemicals. And we have a challenge in terms of understanding where the chemicals are used and what the exposures are. And that's in, large, in part because there's no law requiring that the chemical companies tell us where all their chemicals and products are being um, used. And so there is one of the parts about exposure science is this sort of detective game and trying to ascertain where chemicals are showing up in various types of products. So we've seen a large growth in the number of chemicals that NHANES is biomonitoring. It's gone up to about 350 chemicals, and NHANES just oops, released a report last uh, this year with a whole new set of chemicals that they've been monitoring, including uh, a new new ones for VOCs, but we're still only monitoring or doing biomonitoring on a small fraction of the high use chemicals. Um, I've, I've used the word I use high use because the EPA just recently did a reset of their inventory on chemicals that are monitored under the Toxic Substances Control Act. It's about forty thousand, but not all of them are used in high use. About eight thousand are used reimported in more than 25,000 pounds. So those are ones that we're more likely to be exposed to than um, possibly the other ones on the top inventory. Nonetheless, we're still only really capturing information on a small fraction of these 8,000 high-use chemicals in terms of exposures and actually even for understanding their potential for health effects. So there's a lot of unknown um, chemicals. Some of them we can use different databases to identify whether we might be concerned about their exposures, which I'll briefly touch on. But then there's a lot that are just, we aren't even really sure because we don't have the data collected or the data's not being required to be collected in terms to understand um, those exposures. So essentially the problem is piled up. And now we have a wicked problem. We have lots of chemicals. We don't really have the capacity to measure them, and even Marie Kondo can't clean this stuff up for us. So we have to work together to 
uh, look at ways to increase the impact of our science to um, design it in ways that will help us uh, both advance our scientific understanding uh, just in general and also to help us design studies that are policy relevant and solution oriented to help address these problems so that we can focus on improving health. The other area is to engage with partners who've been a very successful part of strategies to identify and reduce those harmful chemical exposures. And communication is a, also an important part of putting out, taking the science and being able to synthesize it and make it understandable to people who, either the public or to people who can take action on these chemicals and then having direct engagement with those who have an influence over chemical exposures is a critical part of making our science impactful. And all of these are uh, important for communicating around policy engagement, which is an effective way to reduce chemical exposures that are harmful. So um, I just to talk a little bit more about some of the work that we're doing here to uh, and ex use the exposure sciences to really um, as a critical piece in our in effort to uh, achieve these goals. So I'm going to talk about a chemical that we study at UCSF, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, because a good example of about where we can take the different aspects of um, measuring exposures to uh, understand and address uh, potentially harmful exposures. So polybrominated diphenyl ethers are flame retardant chemical. They're found in, uh, have been used in polyurethane foam as well as other uh, applications. And I'll talk a little bit more about this flammability standard. So they're found in many different types of applications. There, as I said, they're used in polyurethane foam, so they can be found in upholstered furniture. They can also be found in home insulation, in carpet padding that's made with recycled foam, um, some baby products, but there's actually been a lot of success in getting them removed from baby, baby products, plastic casing for electronics, but also because they're not bound to the foam, they can get out and get into dust where people can be exposed. And they're also a persistent biocumulative chemical, so they um, hang around, they don't break down, um, they migrate up into the food chain. So you can see they get into dust, they can get into the food chain, they're fat loving, so you can get exposed to them through fat. Uh, they've been measured in many different animals, including cats and dogs, but also higher order animals such as fish, birds of prey, and polar bears, and they've also been measured ubiquitously in people. So PVD exposures are not uniform across the United States, and this is important because it speaks to other um, to other ways that exposure science can help us address uh, various aspects of or vulnerabilities in the population. So exposure studies have shown that some populations have potentially higher exposures. So low SES, socially vulnerable um, uh, communities of color can have higher exposures to some of these chemicals. And this is an important aspect when we're thinking about particularly areas around health disparities. Children can also have higher exposures, but also, uh, uh, lucky us, Californians. So geography can be an important, play an important role in exposures to these uh, chemicals. So one of the drivers for uh, why Californians are, actually this is the driver for why Californians have higher levels of PBDEs and other flame retardant chemicals is because of this California Technical Bulletin 117, which was, uh, Implemented in 1975, it's a performance-based standard. Uh, it requires a foam that if you have a couch and you peel off the fabric and you have the foam there, you had to withstand open flame for 12 seconds, which was impossible without these chemicals. So um, it was a very unique standard. No other state had it. I will just say that California did not have less fire dust than any other state, but they had this. They had more flame retardant chemicals. So some important... Exposure studies show that uh, social economic status and race, race ethnicity matter. So in California, we both have higher, ex have higher exposures to these PBDs compared to other states. So this is um, PB BDE 99 measured in household dust, which is an important route of exposure. 
you can see that the exposures um, in low-income and minority communities are much higher than communities that are more wealthy and white, and those are higher than other communities in the United States, which are even higher than Europe and China. So we're able to parse out who has higher exposures using measurements of these chemicals in an exposure media house desk. But we can also see the influence of um, bio, using biomonitoring to understand who's exposed um, in terms of vulnerable stages of development. This is during the prenatal stage. This is from a study, uh, from our studies that we're, we're looking at PBDEs and finding that um, this is from a study measuring PBDEs in pregnant women in California. Uh, this is from Northern California, and you can see their levels of PBDEs, this is the sum of PBDEs, is much higher for, in all the PBDEs than these other populations. It's higher than NHANES, it's higher than Salinas Valley, which that is in California, but these women are primarily immigrants from Mexico, so um, what you're getting is that people who are born in the U.S., and we've seen this in other studies, this is from the Chamacos data from UC Berkeley, as well as their own, that being born in the United States, you get a high, or being born in California, you have higher levels of PD exposure than if you're born elsewhere and higher than Spain. And this is a, a very compelling because it found that these, we used to say, talk about how California women, pregnant women, have the highest level of PDs in the world compared to other pregnant women in the world. And then finally, this is data from um, UC Davis from their Children's Center showing that children have higher levels, children between the ages two to five have higher levels of PBDEs. And what was really shocking about this study is that their levels are just as high as occupational foam workers. So this is children right here, and then here's the foam workers here. Um, and it's largely probably due to the fact that they're crawling around and it's in dust and it's getting, um, they have hand and mouth activity, so they're getting higher exposures. So again, this is a very similar to that. We have these different snapshots of exposure, and now we um, showing that there both is widespread exposure, and that there are certain populations, including those that can be more vulnerable to these exposures, have higher levels of exposures. So what about the health effects from PBDE? So we've seen um, there's been a number of different studies of these in animals and in vitro, looking at how PBDEs may adversely influence brain development possibly through affecting thyroid hormone, through thyroid hormone disruption. Um, so it's been shown in vitro to uh, potentially dis disrupt fetal human brain cells. Prenatal exposures to PBDs in animals can affect learning, memory, and attention. So the thing is that people now, they know about the exposures, they hear that it's health effects. Well, one of our challenges is how do we talk to people about these or tell people about these exposures or policymakers about what these exposures mean. People say, well, I have this measure in my body. Is it really high? Um, doctors where, who are an important constituent because they interface with patients, but they're also really important because they have um, a lot of authority to speak on the behalf of their health, behalf of the health of their patients, particularly in policy settings, don't know how to talk about these chemical exposures. They don't know what the science says, it's very different. They say, um, if you don't have good information to give back, it can be a disservice to our patients. This is from a focus group that we did with uh, clinicians at UCSF. And they're also very concerned about the fact that um, a lot of the advice that is, as a physician, as an OB, that they're giving to patients is going to put the burden on that pregnant woman when the reality is um, larger change is important in terms of uh, making a difference for these women because a lot of these exposures are not necessarily within their control. So, uh, but one of the challenges we have is that you have a lot of science, it's all kind of in different places, and we're expecting the public and or physicians to interpret all this science and give their opinion, or a policymaker to get, under, interpret the science, give their opinion, and then um, provide an, 
an answer to people's questions about about what these mean. So well, it's a little bit like, and you know, there's a lot of literature that we have that we're trying to sort through in terms of understanding all the different types of animal studies, in vitro studies, human observational studies. So another aspect to helping us interpret the data that's coming from this exposure science is to create a more um, systematic way to under, to evaluate the scientific information. So I just want to say that uh, talk briefly about this work that we've done um, to bring systematic review methods to environmental decision making. This is from something that we started in 2009, which is called the Navigation Guide, which um, is a systematic review method that can be used to evaluate environmental health sciences to come up with a bottom line summary that can be can tell decision makers, whether it's in clinical care or public policy, what does the science mean um, in terms of the strength of evidence about the relationship between the exposure and health effects. And importantly, this method is based on methods that are used, uh, are considered evidence-based rigorous methods within the clinical medicine, which is the Coffin Collaboration and GRADE. And the, the goal of this is to both provide a bottom line summary of the evidence so that actions can be taken more quickly, and then also to make the science that we're doing be use the same methods that are used in clinical medicine so that they look and so that they provide a level of trust to the clinical community because they know that we're um, using methods that they also use to essentially grade the science for its quality and um, consistency. Um, so the systematic review navigation guide says make a bottom line summary of evidence that clinicians can trust, clinicians and policymakers can trust, the systematic reviews in environmental health. And uh, um, there's been a great amount of uptake since we started this, uh, developed this method in 2009. The National Academy of Sciences have done three different reports which talk about systematic review methods, and one of them which I'll talk a little bit more in relation to PBEs. Um, the World Health Organization and the International Label Organization are using the Navigation Guide to uh, develop a burden of disease for occupational health, the global burden of disease for occupational health exposures. And that's actually very interesting because they've developed, this method is used for um, looking at the evidence that links exposures to health effects, but they also have adapted the method to look at exposure science studies. So that will be a very interesting um, way to uh, evaluate the exposure science literature to get better or understand the exposure measurements that are happening in, in occupational health studies. Um, so the, uh, the way we took the systematic review and so we had these different exposure elements uh, showing us that PBDEs were widespread, that we had higher exposures to vulnerable populations, and we also had evidence that indicated that it, the exposures could affect neurodevelopment. So we, so we did a systematic review on the human epidemiological literature, the observational human studies, and you can see them right here, to understand what the to grade the strengths of the evidence of the, the relationship between prenatal exposures to PBDEs and IQ, decrements in IQ measured in, in the children. So these studies were um, all done by Children Environmental Health Center. So one, uh, three of them, or three of them, one of them was done in Spain. Um, so one's in Cincinnati. The other one's the Columbia Center for Children's Health, and then the Chimaco study. And you can see here that they had all found um, decrements in IQ from prenatal exposures to PVDEs, but once we put them all on the same scale and did a meta-analysis that we found a statistically significant decrement in IQ because part of the challenge of looking at these environmental chemical exposures and health outcomes is you often need a higher sample size in order to see effects if they're really there. Uh, the, we also graded the evidence and came up with a finding that there was sufficient evidence that PVDEs was linked to IQ. 
But the National Academy of Sciences also did a systematic review of PBDEs and IQ. They used our systematic review. They basically reviewed our systematic review and found it um, was of low bias. And then they uh, also looked at the animal literature and they um, came up with the conclusion that PBDEs are presumed hazard to human intelligence. So, um, so you can see that we've taken the exposure science and then knitted it together to the PBDEs. So one of the things that we can now do, because we have used this rigorous method, we have the exposure studies to show that people are exposed, occur during these prenatal periods, and we have rigorous evidence showing that there's a link to human health effects. We can then take this to partners who can help us talk about this science. So one of the areas that we have focused on, which we've talked about throughout this, is working with our clinical partners to get them to be engaged on environmental health. So this is from uh, some work we did with the American Co College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and American Society of Reproductive Medicine. So ACOG represents this professional society for OBGYNs in the United States. American Society of Reproductive Medicine is professional society for reproductive health specialists. And they issued a committee opinion in 2013, which was about environmental reproductive health. And they summarized the evidence saying that exposure to toxic environmental agents and adverse reproductive and developmental health outcomes is robust. And importantly, they said that it's time for them to take action to reduce, to identify and reduce exposure to toxic environmental agents. And again, a lot of this, there's their um, understanding and comfortableness with, and the importance of this topic came from studies showing that pregnant women are exposed to chemicals, not only just PBDEs and phthalates, but a whole host of other chemicals. Um, they've also gone on to work with the International Federation of OBGYNs, which is an umbrella organization that represents OBGYN societies from over 120 countries and their recommendations are to advocate for policies to prevent exposures, harmful exposures, uh, ensure a healthy food system, make environmental health part of healthcare, and champion environmental justice, again, because we've seen that this environmental justice or dis, uh, disparate exposures to um, chemicals or environmental hazards happen to different populations. So um, PBDEs were banned in California in 2006, um, so actually it was banned before a lot of the those studies on health effects came out, so it was the, part of the ban was driven by the fact that we knew that they were potentially harmful from animal studies and that they were increasing in the population, again, from exposure science studies. They're phased out nationally, but what we're able to show, uh, looking at, um, again, measurements from pregnant women in Northern California that after the ban, that there was a 45% drop in PBDE levels in pregnant women in California. So this is 2008 and 9, 2011 and 12, and 2014. So you can see that the ban, similar to other bans that have been having, have been effective in reducing chemical exposure levels in the population. But then new flame retardants came in to replace old ones, kind of like the phthalate story, have this whack-a-mole problem. So one of the things that has happened is that based on the exposure studies, the science showing that um, chemicals are, if CBD chemicals are linked to IQ effects on neurodevelopment, you can see that the paper was published in the Chronicle, but then we can take that and go talk to, this is um, uh, at the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, and work with, so we've already engaged with our clinical partners. So here's um, Dr. Mario Zlatnik, he's an OB, UCSF, Dr. Vina Singla is a scientist, program reproductive health and environment, and they're testifying before the uh, Board of Supervisors about a San Francisco ordinance to ban all flame retardant chemicals in products. So it took it from PBDEs, and to address this regrettable substitution problem, San Francisco said, you know, we're going to ban all these chemicals so that we're just going to remove them from the product stream. So that's so San Francisco did ban um, the sale of furniture that contained flame retardant chemicals, and then this went on to become, um, get introduced into the California legislature, and last year, 
before our governor, Jerry Brown, left. Oh, he uh, signed legislation to protect, to ban uh, toxic flame retardants from all um, all uh, upholstered furniture in California. So California went from laggard to leader. Uh, so now we have, um, but we still have many choices left because we've just touched some of the challenges that we have ahead of us. So um, one of the things that we're doing is to advance, so we have ability to do targeted methods for biomonitoring chemical exposures. So as I mentioned, we're only capturing a fraction of the chemicals that are uh, met, that, that we may potentially be exposed to. So one of the areas that we and other um, labs are doing around the country is to uh, develop these non, non-targeted or suspect screening methods to scan for chemical exposures in biological samples. So this is from a study that we published last year, um, which is a proof of concept method to screen for, um, use a suspect screening, a high resolution mass spectrometry to screen for industrial chemicals in pregnant women and pregnant women who uh, attend clinics here at UCSF. And we had 75 women and we focused on a, a subset of chemical groups, about 600 what we're calling environmental organic acids, which are include plasticizers like phthalates and um, BPA, um, certain pesticides, um, as well as uh, some other, a few other chemicals. And we um, focused on trying to scan for chemicals that are not currently biomonitored in the in sort of more larger programs like NHANES to see if we could identify novel chemicals that might be present in pregnant women that we had are previously unidentified. It also helps us because it's um, it's more of a scan. You have to identify chemicals and then develop a targeted method to get accurate detection and, and levels. We also wanted to use it as an approach to prioritize chemical exposures for future biomonitoring or health studies. So in this study, we found about, uh, on average, about, we found a couple of things. One is that, as we had shown previously, that there is ubiquitous exposure to multiple chemicals. So um, the lowest number of hits that we had was 32. The average was about 50, was 56, and the most was 73. Um, but we were able to confirm the presence of six novel chemicals and two of them were our high production chemicals in the United States. Also, fits with our hypothesis that we may, uh, that there are more chemicals that we may be exposed to, and some of them are related to the level of production that is going on in the United States. Uh, but just the understanding exposures is only one part, because we're also limited in our ability to understand health effects from these uh, chemical exposures. I want to say that um, while epidemiolo we do epidemiology studies in our group and they're very important, they're also can be a little late for people. Be they are late because we're necessarily finding a health effect and, an ex and that linked exposure. And what we'd like to do is move upstream and identify health effects before we observe them in the population. So. Uh, there's a number of efforts that are going on. A lot of this is being led by EPA and NIEHS around developing ways to use in vitro and in silico methods to screen for these chemicals that we're measuring in people to identify their potential health effects. And this is some work that we're doing to contribute to that using a yeast screening assay and a C. elegans assay to screen for reproductive and developmental health effects. And um, I want to also and note that um, there's a lot of work that we're doing to understand exposures to chemicals and how they're related health effects. But this is part of a larger network of um, work that's being done by NIHS and EPA Children's Centers. Um, the Children's Centers work on a variety of different types of exposures, including agricultural chemicals, air pollution, contaminated food and wide, water, pesticides and cleaners, all focused around windows of susceptibility and various types of health outcomes. 
And their goal is similar to what we're doing at UCSF, is to multidisciplinary interactions accelerate translation and to reduce the environmental contaminant burden of childhood disease. I wanted to do a call out to the children's centers because their funding is ending and I just would like there's no plan to renew them yet, and but they've made a lot of really important contributions to a lot of it based on exposure science. So the work around um, what Dartmouth did to find that uh, looking at arsenic, particularly in rice, in rice, but also particularly in infant rice cereal, has been very instrumental in FDA lowering their they're creating recommendations for how much arsenic is should be in sure there shouldn't be any arsenic in rice really but anyway um, the science also supported Hawaii as the first state to ban chlorpyrifos so EPA did say they were going to ban it in 2016 and magically that was revoked in later even though the courts upheld that but anyway Hawaii went ahead to ban chlorpyrifos and then the, the studies have also been very in instrumental in California becoming a leader in changing their flammability standards. So also the Consumer Product Safety Commission, I shouldn't just say that, Consumer Product Safety Commission did also, at the end of the Obama administration, recommend banning all halogenated flame retardants, which is a huge step and in large part due to these exposure science studies showing that um, these exposures matter. Um, I just want to uh, also say that there's an opportunity to advance some of these exposure science that we're working. I'm a part of the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes, ECHO. It's funded by NIH, the longitudinal linked cohort, 50,000 children across the United States. We're looking for opportunities to advance our understanding about exposures that occur during prenatal um, and childhood periods so that we can um, better address environmental contributed contributors to childhood disease. And this is from some work that was led by Ed Ito Pelizari and Debbie Bennett, because again, one of the things we're trying to do is capture where are there exposures that may be of importance to child health. And we actually, there are quite a few available data sources. They're not as complete as we'd like them, but we do still have data, like monitoring data from USDA, FDA, EPA, that have information about chemicals um, available, some available information about where chemicals are used and monitoring for them in various like drinking water, air, house dust, food, and then of course uh, NHANES. And we can use that data to help us prioritize chemicals that are more likely to have exposures, uh, particularly during uh, exposures to the public. So that's those databases, which are important because those if we're monitoring them in the exposure media, we're we could be capturing them before people get exposed. And then integrating that with data that is available on chemicals in various product categories so that we can prioritize chemicals to be measuring within the ECHO cohort. So uh, uh, this is, uh, say, we, we um, want to continue to make the connections between the science that we're producing around the exposures and the uh, people who can help us move the needle in terms of improving and our ability to prevent these har to preventing harmful chemical exposures. And this will continue to engage with the clinical community as they engage with the with the policy community and. These are two um, obstetricians that we have worked with. Um, Dr. Jeannie Connery, um, who used to be the president of the American Conference of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, is now the president-elect of FIGO and has made environmental reproductive health one of her signature issues. So we're seeing a real elevation of environmental health, um, for um, particularly for women and women of reproductive age um, at an international level. And this is Dr. Linda Judy who was the president of American Society of Reproductive Medicine, who's still active in environmental reproductive health, and she's testifying in the state legislature on toxic chemicals in consumer products. So in conclusion, um, environmental exposure, I think we know, environmental exposures are an important contributor to childhood disease, and that understanding exposures and um, being able to address them are an important factor in our efforts to um, identify and reduce harmful chemical exposures. So we continue to need 
these types of efforts like what NIHS invest in in order to um, make progress in this area. I'd like to thank everybody, our funders, the NIHS and EPA and NIH, and our affiliates and staff, and please follow us. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and uh, other various forms of social media.